Guys, we're talking today uh, about a pretty hot topic. There's there's a lot of political talk on this topic, uh, but as you know, the Build Show doesn't get into politics. What we get into is how to build a better house. And no matter what side you fall on, polit on the political aisle, what we care about on the Build Show Network is well-built houses. Our slogan is no better, build better. And so we're gonna be talking specifically today uh, about electrification and decarbonization. But I think where the rubber meets the road on this topic is well-built homes. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, it doesn't matter what party you affiliate with, uh, you care about well-built homes, probably for your customers, but also certainly for yourself, for your own family, for your own personal house. You want a house that's resilient, a house that's comfortable, a house that might be able to go uh, for a day or two without power or longer in, in today's world. Uh, and of course, on this particular topic, uh, we're also talking about uh, high efficiency equipment that's going to save you dollars in both short term, uh, dollars long term, and potentially uh, reduce our need for fo for fossil fuels as a country uh, in the future. And uh, you know, one of the things I love about Build Share Network is that we get to kind of see what's on the on the uh, short term future horizon, but also what's on the long term future horizon. So with that being said, let me kick off the program. I want to introduce to you our two speakers uh, today. First off, we've got Michael Carter, product uh, manager with Carrier. Michael's going to be spending some time with us today talking specifically about uh, what does high, how does high efficiency HVAC equipment lead the charge and when it comes to this decarbonization electrification topic. Michael also has uh, a bunch of slides talking about the Inflation Reduction Act rebates, how to take advantage of that, whether you're a builder or a model or a homeowner. And then also I've got Dean Gamble, uh, who works for the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, uh, of which the EPA, you probably are real familiar with Energy Star for Homes. That's who Dean works for. And Dean's going to be talking a very, about a very specific part uh, of the Inflation Reduction Act, which really comes down to new construction homes. So we got a great program. And by the way, I do want to say a huge thanks to Carrier for sponsoring this uh, webinar today. And if you didn't hear it earlier, if you're signed up for the webinar, you're going to get an ebook uh, later from my team that will kind of summarize this and give you everything in print so you can see it. If you're watching this later and you weren't able to see this webinar, this webinar live, uh, you can sign up to get a copy of that ebook. There'll be a link in the description below. And lastly, if you're watching the webinar today live with us uh, on your Zoom app. There's a Q&A tab. Uh, if you have a question as anyone's talking, feel free to drop it in that Q&A tab at any time. We don't use chat uh, on this. This is not, uh, chat is not a feature that we typically use during webinars. So if you wanna reach me, I'm looking at this Q&A tab the entire time uh, and I'll be queuing up questions because really this is uh, Dean and Michael's show. So that being said, Michael, why don't you kick it off? Uh, first off, I only gave you a quick introduction, Michael. Why don't you tell us what you do yeah. for Carrier? And then uh, tell us about this decarbonization electrification topic. Uh, why is it important and how does HVAC fit in here? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so again, yeah, my name is Michael Carter. I'm the product manager for heat pumps uh, for Carrier Corporation, uh, specializing mostly in just residential uh, heat pumps. Uh, been with the company almost three years. Uh, and was previously the ductless heat pump product manager. So I've had a, a little bit of experience on both sides, both unitary and, and ductless. Uh, but within Carrier, our, our primary role for uh, product managers is to really lead the charge for our uh, product lines. So uh, developing the scope, developing um, the strategic vision of, of the product offering and taking in, you know, customer, uh, vo a voice of customer, what we call VOC, uh, talking with dealers and distributors and determining what the needs of the market are and really building that into the requirements for our products. So uh, that's primarily um, kind of what we do as product managers. So I mean, today's topic is really around, you know, decarbonization and, and electrification. So just a little bit about what that is. When we think about decarbonization, what that really is is reduction of our reliance on uh, fossil fuels. And electrification is a real big part of that. So uh, it, it not only means you know getting away from fossil fuels, but also 
uh, lowering greenhouse gases in, in our environment. So uh, another part of that is lowering our GWP of our refrigerants that we use. Uh, that's sort of the next step uh, that you know a lot of HVAC manufacturers are going to be going into going into 2025 as those new regulations uh, come into effect. Um, and why this matters, it, it's really all about providing a greener, more sustainable tomorrow. Um, we're seeing a lot of new ESG trends that really establish this as a major uh, topic of importance uh, for millennial home buyers and a lot of uh, do-it-yourselfers, right? Because mm. everyone wants to save money, but why, why not save money and help uh, help tomorrow's uh, world, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the bottom line for both us and for giving us uh, a future that our kids are going to want to inherit, right? Absolutely. Uh, but yeah. what I love about what we're talking about here, too, though, is, you know, in this case, it's it's frankly okay to be a little bit of selfish and like, what's the bottom line for me, Michael? Yeah. Uh, you know, because as we talk about uh, better HVAC systems, uh, you know, decarbonization, electrification is one part of it. Another part of it is just a more comfortable, more durable system that uses less electricity where I have to fork out less of my hard earned dollars to pay for my electric bill. Right. And, exactly. and, uh, and with that being said, Michael, how does HVAC fit into this? Well, it's a, it's, it's very interesting. If you, uh, don't know, uh, you know, Residential and commercial buildings are collectively one of the leading contributors to energy usage and emissions. So when you combine direct emissions as well as indirect, which is, you know, the emissions that are required to generate electricity, um, residential and commercial buildings are by far uh, one of the leading contributors to those uh, those emission factors. So it, if you break it down even further, you know, HVAC systems represent more than half of the energy used in residential applications. So by offering higher efficiency, uh, all electric comfort solutions uh, that many HVAC manufacturers make, but carrier especially, we can play a very significant role uh, in decarbonization. So you know, there are solutions like heat pumps that both heat and cool your home that are all electric, uh, ductless systems that, again, are all electric and don't require duct work to uh, to provide comfort to your home. And then uh, BRF systems, which, again, all electric. Those are traditionally for commercial applications, but uh, they are gaining a, a rise in, or getting a rise in uh, popularity in residential applications. So um, there's also options with dual fuel. So you can use your your fueled or uh, uh, your standard furnace combined with a heat pump and, you know, get the benefits of both, especially when you're in the north. Um, but it still does drive decarbonization because you're using electricity to heat your home further into the cooler season. So uh, no matter the scenario, carrier does have solutions for those needs. That's good stuff, man. And speaking of which, uh, Michael, why don't you, uh, I know you've got some PowerPoint slides kind of queued up for us. Uh, in this particular topic, I think a lot of people are here to, to hear the next part of our presentation, which really is where the rubber meets the road. This new Inflation Reduction Act uh, that was passed recently, uh, we know a fair amount about it, but there is still a little bit of fuzziness uh, what can you tell us about the IRE uh, and specifically to that audience here, which is that builder, remodeler, architect, and of course, all of us, uh, either homeowners or wanting to be homeowners someday? Yeah, so, yeah, there's been definitely a lot of uh, energy around the IRA. Um, it comes in a lot of different forms. A lot of different questions are in, <laughs> constantly in my inbox, but uh, I'll give a brief overview of really what uh, affects residential um, homeowners uh, and, and the, the access that they have and the type of products that uh, they, they'll need to look for. Um, one critical note, you know, um, a lot of information is still trickling in. So uh, please be, you know, patient, both with, you know, the manufacturers that you're dealing with and, um, you know, anyone that uh, you're you're looking for information from, because though there's a lot we do know, 
there's still some unknowns. Now, Carrier is pre prepared for this growth. Uh, we're leaning into new and improved financing programs uh, and always keeping our resources current. Uh, we're also looking for ways to help homeowners capitalize on these uh, incentive programs. Now, OEMs everywhere are citing new financial bundles and the IRA as growth opportunities. So at Carrier, we're building up our inventory, we're uh, investing in these new programs and launching a lot of resources to prep dealers and homeowners uh, for the future. Um, so we're working with you know, our contacts in DC to uh, that work with these uh, Inflation Reduction Act details uh, utility rebates, tax credits, and more. And as we get more information, we'll provide you that information as well. Awesome. So uh, you know that there's roughly around $9 billion that's going back to the economy uh, around rebates. Uh, that's just a portion of what's being made available through the IRA. There's actually 369 billion that's under the OIRA uh, umbrella. Uh, now that uh, pertains to infrastructure, but a portion of that, which is around 45 billion, has been allocated to help offset the cost of investments in residential HVAC equipment. So um, we can really focus on what we're what we know today and what we can. Uh, from an HVAC manufacturer standpoint, really address. So the big question you'll hear and what we hear a lot is what products apply uh, or do uh, does the IRA apply to? So at a very high level, without getting into the, the nitty gritty, uh, the primary focus for our product line is 25C. That's a portion of um, the IRA. Um, there's also a few other um, tax credits that are, you know, available under IRA. Dean will get into uh, one in, in a few. Uh, but being that 25C is our primary focus, um, until the IRS publishes official tax guidance, um, there has been a little bit of ambiguity surrounding how closely the 25C will have to align with CEEs. Uh, which is the Consortium of Energy Efficiency, um, which is a requirement by the IRA to uh, that the IRA has to align to. Uh, there has been a little bit of ambiguity, but we've been releasing bulletins as we get more information, uh, providing more um, marketing collateral for our dealers and, and dis uh, distribution uh, partners. Um, so taking a look at ACs, what we do know is that a AC has to be between 15.2 and 16 SEER 2. Now, these are all based on the new 2023 M1 standard um, uh, product criteria. Uh, package splits um, must be 15.2. Split ACs must be 16 uh, SEER 2. Hmm. Now, for gas furnaces, it's, it's very simple. 97 AFUE rated, and that's nationally. Now, heat pumps, obviously, from my uh, from my, my world, has been a, a little bit of a, a whirlwind because uh, there's a lot more regional um, aspects to the heat pump. Hmm. Um, there are not only differences in the offering itself, and as far as how the, it's rated or what the rating criteria is, is uh, that's what's required, but um, depending on where you install or where you live, if it's north or south, there's also um, EER and HSPF2 differences. So again, across the board, between 15.2 and 16 SEER, two uh, heat pump products are eligible for the IRA with some stipulations around low ambient heating specifications, as well as some changes in EER and HSPF2. Hmm. So uh, overall, tax credits and how the IRA worked with these is that the IRA essentially just extended the existing 25C and 25D tax credits. Now I talked a little bit about 25C relative to HVAC equipment. 25D is very similar, uh, except that it, it only speaks to geothermal heat pumps. 
Uh, Carrier has a wide line of, of geothermal heat pumps that do meet the criteria for 25D. So if you're interested in that type of uh, system, then you know please look us up. Now, we have created a couple of websites and a couple of resources that lay this out, but overall, there's a $600 to um, $2,000 credit for each type of uh, each piece of equipment. So for ACs, it's up to $600. For those 97% AFUE furnaces, up to $600. But for heat pumps and really pushing towards that electrification piece is the uh, $2,000 uh, tax credit for high efficiency heat pumps. Uh, for geothermal heat pumps in that 25D tax credit, it's up to 30% of the installation costs through 2032. Hmm. So, you know, obviously geothermal heat pumps are a little bit more expensive. It's a, it's a heavier investment, but they are efficient and they will drive towards the uh, um, return on investment of your home too. Now, Again, these, these tax credits have been extended for 10 years. So through 2032, um, you should be, able, if you're installing through 2032, you'll be able to, uh, you know, continuously uh, use these tax credits, not only for HVAC equipment, but also for other energy saving uh, improvements you do in your home, like insulation. I think there's benefits for solar, um, roofing, windows, doors, things that are applicable to making your energy footprint smaller. So uh, talked about tax uh, credits now for federal rebates. Um, there, it's a little bit more challenging here because there's really a not a lot of, not a lot that we know yet. Um, Though these are federal rebates or federally funded rebates, they will be administered at a state level. Uh, what we do know is that none of the states have set up the programs for these uh, uh, rebate programs. So um, the expectation is a, a lot of these programs won't be available until 2024, but there are two overall rebates available, the HEE HRP and the HOMES rebate. Um, both of which sort of point or towards the Energy Star, you know, criteria is the basis of, of the uh, rebate program, but um, there are a little bit more stipulations around the homes rebate. Now, H -E HRP, um, which is a tongue twister to say <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> yeah, it uh, is, Michael. Uh, it does have some uh, limitations around uh household income, they, if you make over 150% of your local median income, you're not eligible for that, uh, that rebate. Hmm. Um, all of these are really to reduce, you know, the, or drive, you know, lower income households to invest in um, more efficient uh, HVAC systems. Now, these two programs, again, on the last note there, um, they will run until 2031, but it's a finite amount of money for both of these rebate programs, $4.3 billion each. And as soon as that money is depleted, and depending on the administration at the time, if it's not uh, um, invested in again, once that money is gone, it's gone. So uh, as soon as these programs get set up in your state, please take advantage of them and um, and make sure that you, you get your portion of that if you do apply. So now we talked about the IRA and the tax credit and the rebates are in included, but there are also local utility rebates that are outside of the IRA. So you have um, in 38 states and in Canada, these local rebate programs that are driven by the utility companies. and. Obviously, it's a, they're incentivized to get you to use less energy, right? Um, or use the energy that you use uh, in a more efficient manner. So this is happening at a regional level with programs like NEEP um, in the Northeast, uh, Colorado Heat Pumps and Building Decarbonization Materials Tax Credit Act, and in Napierville uh, in the Chicagoland area, there's an air source heat pump rebate program, and these are just a few of them. So. Uh, look up the local rebate programs uh, from both 
energystar.com, but also Carrier has an eco rebates page. Um, both of these are pretty hmm. great resources to find uh, local rebate opportunities in your area. Uh, hey, let me ask you real question, real quick on that, Michael. That eco rebates page is that if we Google that, can we get to that? Can get to that page, or is that uh, a yeah, URL you know off the top of your head? Uh, so if you go to carrier.com, um, now you should be able to Google it, uh, eco rebates, and then carrier. But if you go to carrier.com and then scroll down to the bottom, there is a rebates or uh, rebates section or subsection that you can find. Cool. And that will lead you to a, excuse me, a website where you can just put in your zip code and then each piece of equipment will tell you what uh, tax credits, what rebate programs and you, local utility rebate programs are available for that, that system. That's so, awesome. It's a really great tool. And uh, if you don't mind a quick interruption too, Michael, I would say that uh, I grabbed off your website as I was prepping for this a really great document called the uh, IRA uh, Inflation Reduction Act Frequently Asked Questions document. This can be helpful for y'all too uh, if you're on the carrier website. Download this. This gives you a lot of good information as well. Uh, and and some of actually what we're talking about today is on is on that as well as another resource, another document from Carrier's mm -hmm. uh, webpage. Yeah, effectively, I just took my inbox and turned it into an FAQ. Oh, you wrote this? Is that right? How about that? I pl Good plug then. How about that, Michael? Very yeah. cool. So all the questions I got, you know, I kind of boiled them all down to a few and then uh, put the answers on there. So Awesome. Yeah. That's a great resource, Michael. Great resource. Thank you. Keep going, brother. Didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, no, I think uh, we're at the tail end or end here. So, okay. you know, what do we do in the meantime? Um, really, it's all about ramping up your utilization of high efficiency carrier systems. You know, as we continue to learn more about the legislation legislation and how people are going to um, submit claims for tax credits and when these uh, rebate programs are set up, uh, we'll continue to put out more information, make sure everyone's aware of the rebates in their in their region. And, you know, we're continu continuously innovating to make sure that we have the best products available that are the most efficient, most cost effective, and, um, you know, provide the most, the highest level of comfort for the consumer. So uh, please keep in touch, stay tuned, and uh, more is to come. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's jump in with Dean Gamble then from the EPA. Uh, Dean, thanks for your patience. Uh, yeah, you've no got a, You've got a presentation for us. Uh, I think some PowerPoint slides as well. Before you get started, though, I do want to mention uh, if you are just joining us on this live event, if you've got questions for Michael, for Dean, for me, anything that comes up while uh, Dean's presenting, drop that on the Q&A tab. You'll see that somewhere on your Zoom link. And if you're watching this uh, not live, uh, definitely click the link to get on our newsletter so you can find out when these live events happen in the future. But Dean, kick us off. All right. Thanks. Let me share my screen here. Let me know. Is that coming through? I got it. You look great. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me here today. I'm, I'm actually really happy to be joining in. I'm the technical manager for the Energy Star Single Family New Homes Program. We're a small and mighty team, but my primary responsibility is setting the technical specifications for what a home has to do to be certified under that program. And so that's my focus for today. I'm sure that some of you on the call today have, have never heard of the Energy Star Single Family New Homes Program before, and that's <laughs> perfectly fine. Not a problem. Some of you maybe used to participate in some form or another maybe a decade ago, and you're thinking about getting reacquainted with it. And some of you are probably involved today and have been for a long time. That's all great. Um, you know, in the past year or so, we've had more interest in our program than uh, in a long time for some wow. obvious reasons. And so that's what I want to focus on today is where that interest is coming from. I think you know the answer. And then a little bit about what the program actually requires. Cool. And feel free to jump in here, Matt, at any time. And, and if I'm not making sense, you know, I'll say you can set me in the right direction. Will do, Dean. Sounds good, buddy. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and dive right in. So the program itself has a long history and has had a big impact. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, we've been around for over 25 years. We've actually certified more than two and a half million homes and apartments in the residential new construction area. 
And we're still working on finalizing our numbers for 2022, but we're shaping up to have probably our third biggest year in the program's history. So over 140,000 new homes and apartments certified last year alone. Now, why are so many builders interested in this program? Well, I could run through a bunch of different answers. There's um, some things that overlap with what Michael was saying, rising corporate expectations regarding sustainability. There is the brand recognition of the program. There's the government backed label. But the thing that's really driving interest, as you as you might know, is the incentive side of it. Um, certifying homes to the Energy Star program can make you eligible for incentives and federal tax credits, both at the local level and now at the federal level. So as probably many of you on the call have heard, for the first time, the federal tax credit has been tied to the Energy Star program. So let me dive into that in a little bit more detail. So this is another part of the IRA than what Michael was talking about. It's the 45L tax credit for energy efficient new homes. And for homes and dwelling units that are acquired on or after January of January 1st of this year, the base level tax credit is specifically tied to meeting Energy Star program requirements for single family, manufactured and multifamily homes. So all three of the residential new construction sectors that our program covers. Hmm. A higher tax credit is available for homes that are certified to DOE's Zero Energy Ready Homes program, which requires Energy Star certification as a prerequisite. And this last point, again, that Michael said, which is really a big deal, is that this tax credit has been extended through 2032. So it gives builders a little bit of a runway to make decisions about whether they're you know, interested in participating in this program or not. Dean, can I ask you a quick question on that? Just, Absolutely. Just to clarify, it's my understanding that these are tax credits not for the home owner, the person purchasing, but for the home builder, right? Did I get that yes. correct? That's a great clarification. Yeah, so this is giving motivation for the home builders themselves to make the investments in making the home more efficient, which is what Energy Star is driving at, and then getting the financial compensation to help cover that cost. Yeah, and, and let me just comment on this because I think this is a huge deal for people uh, you know, I, I assume my audience is mostly builders like me. You know, if you're a builder watching this, I saw several of your names in the list, in, including I, I know Luke Mesger, who's on the call, is a builder here in Austin that builds the Energy Star. That's 2500 bucks for every house that Luke builds to these standards that gets certified in his pocket, in his tax credit. And remember, this is a credit, too, a tax credit, which is a big deal. Uh, and, and again, this is not for the homeowner to take advantage of. This is for you as the builder to take advantage of. Uh, sorry, Dean, keep going. I just wanted to make sure that was really no. clear because that's, I mean, if you don't learn anything on this whole webinar, uh, you should remember that you build Energy Star Standard with this 45L. This is $2,500 per home. That's a perfect time to add that. So thanks, Matt. Yeah. <clears throat> so diving into a little bit more detail here on what we do know, uh, $2,500 is available for single family new homes that are meeting the Energy Star program requirements. And more specifically for homes that are acquired from January 1st of this year through the end of next year, you have to meet the Energy Star single family new homes national version 3.1 program requirements. And then for homes that are acquired beginning January 1st of 2025, it steps up to national version 3.2 of our program requirements. Now, same caveat that Michael shared before, you know, it's the IRS that's actually implementing this federal tax credit, not EPA. We designed the Energy Star program, but they're the ones responsible for administering the tax credit. And we're all waiting for guidance from the IRS on a couple of issues related to implementation, including, for example, we have some like regional program requirements in California, some other states. So how does that overlap with the national program requirements? That's the sort of guidance that we're waiting on from the IRS. But this gives you, you know, big, big picture in, um, information about what's required. And that's good stuff. And then I'm focused on single family new homes today, but there might be some builders who dabble in low rise, you know, multifamily and that sort of thing. So I just want to touch on these other sectors really quickly. So for multifamily, $500 is available for multifamily dwelling units that meet the Energy Star multifamily new construction national program requirements, or if there's a regional program requirement that applies, then that's what would um, be required instead. 
I included the section from the legislation if you want to dive into some of the details on your own to see that specific language. And then there's a larger tax credit available if you also meet some prevailing wage requirements. Hmm. We're not sure every builder is going to be, you know, doing that for multifamily new construction, but it is there. And then finally, there's um, a separate tax credit for manufactured homes, those that fall under the HUD code as opposed to site built code. And that's $2,500 for manufactured homes meeting the most recent Energy Star manufactured new homes program requirements. So that's a basic lay of the land. Now, going back to single family new homes, your question might be, well, what is what does Energy Star require then? If I can get $2,500, that sounds great, but what do I actually have to do? Mm. So for the rest of my slides, I just want to give a little bit of insight into the single family new homes requirements. And I'm going to focus on the national program requirements because that's what most of the homes are falling under right now. So the short answer to that question is that we require a good energy rating with certain features locked in, plus two comfort features, four air quality features, and a set of durability details. Hmm. And I'm gonna walk through those in a little bit more detail, but this is kind of the elevator pitch. This is, this is the takeaway. So let's start with what we, what we call a good energy rating. Now, a lot of builders are already familiar with the concept of home energy ratings, either ERI ratings or HERS ratings. Those are two names you'll sometimes hear for energy ratings. But for those who haven't heard, uh, an energy rating is an independent assessment by a third party verifier of a home's energy efficiency performance. And this is typically done through visual inspections and diagnostic testing during the construction of a home. It typically happens twice, once before the drywall goes up, and then once at final before closing, they finish their inspections. And what that allows the independent home energy rater to do is assign a score to that home that reflects its overall efficiency. It's generally a scale of zero to 100. And the lower you are on that scale, the better the performance of the home. Okay, so fortunately we know a lot of builders have bought into this message that an energy rating is valuable. There are about 300,000 homes and apartments each year that are getting an energy rating today. Almost exclusively new construction, not existing homes and apartments. And it's even higher last year, I think it was up closer to 340,000 or so. So a lot of homes are already getting an energy rating and that is a great start. Now, <laughs> just because you get an energy rating, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have an efficient home, right? So this beautiful home, that could get an energy rating. Maybe you're gonna get a score of like 130 on the scale. It's like off the charts high, which is not a good sign. So just because you have a rating doesn't mean it's efficient, but it's better than not knowing that it was 130. You're getting some valuable information. In this case, you need to make a lot of improvements if you wanna make it efficient. So to us, a good energy rating is hitting a decent ERI score. And so that's why for the Energy Star program, we define what we call an Energy Star ERI target for each home. And for the national version 3.1 program requirements that are referenced for the early years of the tax credit, that target is generally about 55 to 65 for most homes in the country. Now, the Good news is that of all those 300,000, 340,000 homes that were rated last year, the average score was a 58. So it was squarely in that range to begin with. So That's that means awesome. if you're a builder, you know, who's already doing an energy rating, chances are you're close to checking this particular box for Energy Star certification, which is one of the two major, you know, boxes to check off. Dean, let me let me jump in just to say yeah. real quick that these numbers are very doable for builders. Uh, you're not building to some ridiculous German standard. You're not needing to put in, you know, crazy expensive windows or do, uh, you know, off the wall screwball items. Uh, this is very, very doable for an average builder with just a little bit of knowledge uh, and uh, the ability to to take the time to figure out, hey, how do I get there? This is not crazy. And and builders and i think even homeowners have the understanding that uh you know when i look for that energy star label whether it's a house whether it's a dishwasher whatever it is uh you know these are these are well-built appliances well-built houses but it's not some space age technology you don't need to get to some ridiculous whatever it's just better than the average uh, or frankly better than code and so, you know, if you're a builder watching this, you don't know a whole lot about an Energy Star. Uh, I'm going to ask Dean later, but I bet there's a website that could get you 
uh, going on. Here's what it would take for me to get to these numbers so that you could take advantage of these tax credits. Yeah, that's a perfect reflection of our philosophy where the next step above code is not is not intended to be the end all and be all, the best you can possibly do in the industry. Yep. It's an important next step for a builder to take and it kind of sets them down a journey. There are programs that build on top of Energy Star that will take you the next step and the sure. third step beyond that. That's right. But yeah. but a lot of those people that do those still also do Energy Star for this reason yeah. that we're talking about today because they can take advantage of this 45L. Exactly. Now to your question about what this requires, I just threw up this chart for um, what we call the Energy Star reference design for the national version 3.1 program requirements. So what the reference design is, is a set of prescriptive measures that get used in the background for energy rating software. So when you and your rater go in to put the home that you're building you know, into the software, in the background, it takes that home that you're building and it applies these prescriptive efficiency measures, including some efficient HVAC equipment in here, and it calculates the ERI of that particular home, and that becomes your ERI target for that house. So that becomes the score that you have to meet or beat to meet our performance target. So you can see in here, you know, lots of different uh, measures that cover, you know, from the ground up, how you address efficiency with new construction, everything from insulation to ducts and conditioned space to air sealing to efficient equipment. The thing to keep in mind is this is what you're benchmarked against. So does that mean, for example, you see duct location is in conditioned space? Does that mean you have to have ducts in conditioned space to certify a home as Energy Star? No, but if you don't have ducts in conditioned space, you're going to have to select other measures instead to offset that efficiency. Maybe it's a more efficient water heater. Maybe it's more efficient HVAC equipment. You know, you can pick and choose. So builder is going to mix and match until they're basically hitting equivalent performance, which is that ERI target for each house. Yeah, actually I actually have a question on that. Um, yeah. Considering now we're in this M1 realm of uh, yeah. performance standards, how do how do people installing M1 equipment uh, use this, this chart? That's a great question. So we defined our reference design before M1 is even around. And so this is what's happening in the background in the software to get your target. Now in that rating software that our partners are using, today you can put in the new ratings as the equipment that you're putting into your house that you're building. And what the software is going to do is map that in the background back to equivalent old values and back and forth. So you don't have to worry about translating anything on your end. You're just putting in the new ratings into the software and it will take care of calculating the ERI target for you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Sure. This is a really helpful chart, by the way, Dean. Good. Uh, okay. And uh, actually hold on that chart for one second. I just yeah. wanted to make a mention that if you're, if you're watching this, uh, you know, you could always screenshot too, which I actually did a few seconds ago. I was thinking this would be great <laughs> fodder for me to throw out on my Twitter or yeah. my Instagram feed. Uh, and this is a very uh, thick <laughs> amount of information and just a small chart. Uh, so thanks for putting that together for us, Dean. Keep going. Yeah, for sure. Enjoy. No, no, I'm glad you did. I mean, this is why I put it up because, you know, you tell a builder who's maybe not even doing energy ratings, you have to get to a a 50 and or 55 or whatever. And they're like, what the heck does that mean? Right. If you look at all these measures and you're like, okay, I kind of know what's going into my house from an efficiency perspective. I'm checking a lot of these boxes already. That means by definition, you're getting pretty close to hitting that target because this is what forms that target in the first place. Yeah, and to be so honest, these target numbers aren't that ridiculous for, you know, I'm in climate zone two, which is the far left on the chart. Uh, mm -hmm. These are very doable numbers, guys. I mean, yeah. when was the last time I put anything below a C or 15 in? And obviously yeah. that means if you put an 18 or a 21 in, you're good to go too, right? These are just exactly. the minimums to meet it. Uh, when yeah. was the last time you as a builder put in a dishwasher that wasn't Energy Star rated? I can't remember how many decades it's been since I put one in that wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and, you know, here's just a quick, for instance, lighting 90% needs to be Energy Star rated. 90% of your lights in your house these days are LED cans that are certainly Energy Star rated. And the reason why they probably came up with that 90% is because you have some cool fixture somewhere that maybe is still incandescent, uh, but it's, you know, one fixture out of 30 in your house. And that's why they put this requirement because they're not trying to be, uh, you know, 100%. You can't have that one cool thing or different thing. So these are, yeah. these are very, do all I'm trying to say here, Dean, is this is very doable. Yeah, we think so too. You know, and over time, the tax credit will ramp up to the next level of our program. But this is kind of where it is for 2023 and 2024. And so this gives a great 
head start for builders, especially those that, like you said, are already incorporating efficient features into their houses to begin with. Yep, love it. So, you know, good energy rating, we're talking about a decent ERI target. Um, beyond that, there are other things within this underlying standard that defines home energy ratings that we also want you to do. So a good rating to us means grade one insulation. That means that you're making sure the installer is actually installing the insulation property properly. If you're paying for an R15 high density bat, you want R15 performance out of it. You don't want R13 or worse because it's been poorly installed. Yeah, that's right. And now the, the underlying standard can also assign an, a grade for the HVAC design and installation quality. Um, so grade one is very good and grade two is, you know, okay, it's not terrible, it's not perfect, but it's decent. And the reason we care about this is that unfortunately lots of studies have shown that, especially on the residential side, a lot of systems, the insulation quality suffers. So improper, improper airflow has been found in nearly 50% of HVAC systems and incorrect charge in nearly 60 to 80% of HVAC systems. So unfortunately, you can't just assume as a builder that this is going in right, that everything is being done correctly. You want to actually double check it, and the rater can help do this and assign the grade of one or two. My buddy Jake. There's some other uh, ways to. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, Dean. I was just going to throw in a quick yeah, quote no. that speaks to this. I got a buddy Jake Burton who shoots videos here at the at the build show, uh, and he has the saying he uses all the time that I love, which is trust but verify. Right? I've got a great HVAC contractor. Uh, I trust him. Uh, he's awesome, but I also verify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and that yeah, I think that's a great saying across all of construction is trust your subs, but there's no reason why a trusted sub couldn't be verified, and and exactly. even me, I like that too. You know, even work that I do or whatever falls on my lap, uh, people trust me. But there's nothing wrong with verifying. That's why we do blower doors. That's why we do duct blaster tests. That's why exactly. we get an energy rater as a partner to us, because the times that I've had them come out, they've found things that would have embarrassed me later. <laughs> And a quick note on that is uh, one of my very first houses I built in Texas in the early 2000s, uh, I forgot to insulate the floor on on a crawl space house. And my raider caught it with his FLIR gun uh, on a final inspection. And I thought, man, had I had a client move in and called me for a callback uh, in the wintertime because their floors are cold. And then I realized, oh, shoot, I never insulated this area. How embarrassed would I have been uh, that the client had to find that? So, yeah. I mean, this, this whole notion of, you know, uh, checking, verifying and getting a raider involved, uh, you know, you're going to pay for that. Uh, your clients are going to pay for that. And then you're going to get the tax refund for that, which is 2,500 bucks, uh, on new construction. Thanks for letting me jump in there, Dean. Yeah. I could not have said it better myself. So that's great. So that's kind of what covers a good energy rating. So if you're doing that, you're well on your way towards certification. To that, Energy Star is adding seven mandatory features to all homes. I'm just going to run through those quickly. We start off with an easy one, which is a MERV 6 or better filter properly installed in each heating and cooling system. So this is almost a gimme. Probably every man, probably every builder is doing this already. We want to make sure that's properly installed so the air is going through the filter and not around it. But I think most builders are going to be able to check this box pretty quickly. Number two is a durability feature, what we call the water management system. And this is essentially a set of um, you know, flashing details to make sure that water drains down and away from your house instead of into the house. It's the sort of old, old rule, don't tuck your raincoat into your pants. That's a bad idea. Uh, we wanna make sure that this stuff is being done right, especially for high performance homes. It's essential. And a lot of our partners have gone beyond even what's in the water management system, which is almost entirely in code now at this point, they go beyond our requirements to do third party assessments just because leaks can be so damaging to new construction. Mm -hmm. So this is something you want to pay attention to regardless of whether you do an energy star or not. And I would tell you just to uh, throw my two cents in that I'd rather see yeah, you yeah. build a, a house that's not going to have water management issues than for you to meet energy star requirements. 100%. No, no offense uh, to anybody on this no call, but, taken. Uh, but before you put a good HVAC system in, make sure you uh, take care of your waterproofing issues. That's why I bring it up. Yeah. yeah you know, water can be so much more destructive 100%. than extra energy use. So yeah. And I've talked about this a bunch, but 80% of construction defect litigation is water related. Uh, so you builders, go. you know, we, we preach this all the time and I know I'm preaching to the choir here for the people <laughs> watching this, but take care of water management first. All this comes later. Yep. Thanks for mentioning that Dean. I appreciate that. No problem. 
Uh, so number three is combustion safety. This comes in a couple different flavors. You can use a power vented or a direct uh, vent uh, appliance. You can do combustion safety testing. You can move the combustion appliance outside the pressure boundary of the house, like to a vented attic or a garage, or you can avoid the issue altogether. Use one of the heat pumps like Michael is selling, mm -hmm. you know, just have electric appliances instead of gas appliances. You'll take care of this as well. You know, at the end of the day, you're just protecting your home buyers uh, health and safety. It's, it's pretty, pretty obvious. A lot of builders are doing this already as well, but we just want to make sure it's guaranteed and locked in for every energy star home. Love it, Dane. Number four, complete thermal enclosure system. This might have a little bit more of a learning curve, but it starts off with making sure you have enough insulation and good performing windows to avoid problems and taking care of certain details. So this looks like a well insulated house. The walls looking nice. We see that bright line across the bottom where the uninsulated slab is. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good your ERI rating is. If it's you know 40, that's terrific. But if you have no slab insulation, you're gonna end up with cold feet. It's not what we want to have for the consumer experience of an Energy Star home. So we require slab insulation in mixed and cold climates, you know, no exceptions, basically. That's good. That's real good. You're picking up the next part of this, properly installed insulation as part of the grade one insulation grade. And then to that, we're just adding common sense air sealing details around windows and doors, penetrations, you know, controlling where the air is coming into the house. That's pretty straightforward, but important. And the last part of the thermal enclosure system is the framing. So reducing the uh, um, reducing the thermal bridges in the above grade walls. There are a couple different ways to do this, but we care about it because you know if you look at the framing in a wall, it doesn't look like a lot, but if you move all that framing together onto one side, it's it's about a quarter of your wall. So you have three quarter insulated wall and about a quarter log cabin. You know <laughs> the the studs are not going to be great insulators. And so you want to pay attention to that, have some strategy to reduce the amount of heat going through it. The one that's most commonly used by our builders for the Energy Star program is some advanced framing details. Um, we're talking about consistent on center spacing, two or three stud corners, ladder blocking where interior walls intersect with exterior walls, and optimizing your king and jack studs. Yeah. So just the most basic advanced framing details that can reduce your lumber by about a quarter in your walls. It saves you money, it improves the comfort of the house. It's, it's a good step and uh, to take if you're not already doing that. Yeah, for sure. And by the way, it'll save you money as a builder too, because lumber isn't cheap. Exactly, exactly. So that's four down. The last couple, a whole house fresh air system. You want to basically control when that fresh air is coming into the house. Matt, I'm sure you can't go a day without talking about this because it's so important. Half the <laughs> states recover, require this by code at this point and Energy Star lets you pursue all sorts of different options. You can use a bath fan with a good controller. You can use a return side inlet with a mechanical damper, or you can step up to something better like an ERV or HRV balance system. But you know, the point here is you want to dilute any contaminants in the house with fresh outdoor air and, and don't rely on the whims of mother nature to bring that fresh air into the house. You want it on a controlled, you know, consistent uh, schedule. So that's half of the air quality equation, getting those contaminants diluted. The other half is getting the contaminants out of your house. Probably a lot of builders have heard this, um, especially lately that cooking kicks up a lot of stuff that you don't want your home buyers to breathe in. It's uh, formaldehyde, it's fine particulate matter, it's excessive water vapor. There's a reason that kitchens and commercial you know, settings have these huge exhaust uh, fans with um, you know, large range hoods to get mm -hmm. that all out of the restaurants. You want to do the same thing in a home. So it might look great if you have a, a range hood that is set up to recirculate and just blow that air back in the house. You have less ducting, but it's not doing much for air quality. It's just sort of blowing the contaminants back in the homeowner's yeah. uh, face. That's right. So you want to make sure these are vented to the outside. And last but not least, comfort balanced bedrooms. You know, homeowners spend a lot of time in bedrooms, maybe more there than almost any other room. At night, they're likely to close the doors and you you just need a pathway for that air to go back to the return side of the HVAC system. Um, otherwise, you get stale air, it gets uncomfortable. You can use transfer grills, jump ducts, you can use dedicated returns in the bedroom, or you can even mix in undercut doors. It's not like our top recommendation, but can use that to help meet this comfort balance bedroom requirement. And we've had builders that have fought this tooth and nail. Um, they just didn't believe in it. They weren't going to do it. 
And then this is one that I'm thinking of in particular. We'd work with them for like 10 years. And finally, their in-house HVAC design team realized that their own HVAC designs were just not working without the return air pathway. <laughs> so they turned on a dime and they ended up putting this into all their homes, even in the markets where they weren't doing Energy Star certification. Wow. Because it was the only thing that was making their HVAC design work. That's awesome. Um, so we think it's really important for the consumer you know, experience to get this right. So this is the, you know, going back to that first slide, what do we require? Good energy rating with features locked in, and then we're adding seven key features to that. And, you know, we like builders to ask themselves, which one of these would you leave out of your own house? How much more expensive would it be to add these into a house after construction is complete? We think it's very common sense stuff. And that's kind of, you know, the uh, elevator pitch on, on an energy star. So, so good. If that makes sense here, I'll just add these last next steps and then I'll wrap it up because I've been, I've been going on a little bit. Um, you can download this one pager builder and developer fact sheet at this link, um, or you, know, you can find it on the energystar.gov website. Kind of reinforces a lot of what we talked about today. Next would be to find a rater. They can help assess how close you are to Energy Star. And they're, as Matt said already, they're like your consultant. They'll cover all the details I can't hit in 15 minutes and help you get from where you are to certification so you can get the tax credit. And last step as a builder, you can sign our free partnership agreement. It's quick and easy, Signs, uh, it's one prerequisite you can cross off the list. It makes you eligible to certify homes. So it's a really, really quick step. Uh, I'll just uh, throw up my contact information here. Oh, that's awesome. Screenshot that people, because those are great websites. And you've also got uh, Dean's <laughs> contact on on that on that last yeah, page. Dean, leave go. that up. Leave that page up for okay. a minute, if you would, Dean, before you close out, mm -hmm. just so people can screenshot it or, or write those down. Uh, we've only sure got thing. about ten minutes left, y'all. We might go a minute or two after the uh, hour, but I do want to answer some questions. I've got a couple that I thought of as we were talking. Uh, and we've actually had a couple great ones come through from the crowd as well. So I'm going to jump right in those. Uh, Michael, here's one for you. I'm curious, what would you say is the difference between decarbonization and electrification? What, what does that really mean? Uh, uh, well, you know, decarbonization is sort of the umbrella, right? Uh, it's, it's really the goal of just reducing carbon emissions and, um, Electrification is just a, a way to get there. So, you know, you have decarbonization. We're trying to get rid of carbon emissions. If we move towards more electrification, you know, whether it's electric vehicles, not putting, you know, as much uh, carbon into the environment, uh, lower um, GWP refrigerants. So, you know, we're in 2025 carriers moving from R410A, which has a two th over 2000 um, GWP to R454B, which has uh, just over 400 hmm. uh, GWP. So, and then, you know, electrification from a HVAC perspective is moving from burning fossil fuels, natural gas, propane, everything else to heat your home to uh, heat pumps, which may not heat your home uh, to 100% in the, you know, Montana or Alaska. Uh, but it will extend the period by which you can use electricity to heat your home. So, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Electrification is just part of decarbonization. Good. That's good. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. Cool. Let me let me follow up another question for you, Michael, that's been on that was on my list is when will we know more about this Inflation Reduction Act? When will more information become available, do you think? Yeah. Uh, we think that, uh, you know, based on our conversations with uh, our contacts in D.C. is that we should know more about the what's going to be required to file for the tax credits in the end of Q3 of this year uh, relative to the rebates. Um, we really don't expect those state programs to be set up until early 2024. So, uh, you know, there's probably a fair amount of consumers that are going to wait to, you know, install equipment until those programs are set up. So yeah. uh, rebates 2024, tax credits uh, end of uh, Q3 of this year. Okay, so it's coming soon, but but not here totally yeah. yet. Yeah. Not here totally. Got it. Yeah. Hey, Dean, a question came in that uh, is for you. This is from Paul Schaefer. Uh, and Paul says, previously the 45L had been linked to homes in which the builder has an equity interest. 
In other words, an on your on our lot build, meaning that builder owned lot, versus an on their lot, meaning a custom builder like I am. Is that still the case? That's probably one that we're gonna have to wait for, for guidance uh, from the IRS on. Ah. I don't think we've heard clear clear direction on that one way or another. Okay. I'm afraid. Gotcha. No problem at all. Thank you for answering that. Another yeah. one for you, Dean, while I got you. Uh, this came from Mike Grabowski, and he says, Dean, what's the requirements to become an energy uh, raider, and where in New York can someone be trained to be an energy raider? Is the BPI, Energy Home Auditor, the same certification? Uh, how would you answer that one for Mike? Um, yeah, so we have what we call home certification organizations. They're authorized to issue Energy Star certificates and they define the training requirements that have to be met to work under them. So ResNet is, is one, um, Building Science Institute is another. So, you know, if you've heard of a ResNet Raider, that's the kind of training that you would have to meet. It's not the same thing as BPI, um, but ResNet's not the only actor in the marketplace. And so I don't want to like call them out as a single source. Yeah. Um, if, if Mike wants to follow up with me afterwards, we can talk more online about the other requirements for the other HCOs. Yeah, do that. That'd be great. Uh, yep. And your contact was in there, uh, by the way, Mike, for uh, to get a hold of Dean. Oh, great. Uh, Michael, I've got another one for you. Um, what are some things we can leverage now as more information becomes available? You know, you mentioned a minute ago that it's really mm -hmm. we're still a couple months away from all that. But talk to me about what what it, what we can leverage today from what we know. Yeah. Well, you know, definitely for the tax credits, it's really about if you're going to install anything, really shoot for those higher efficiency and, uh, um, you know, higher performing heat pump systems. So that's going to get you the best bang for your buck from a, a tax credit standpoint. Um, but also really look into your local utility uh, rebate programs, you know, use the eco rebate site, uh, go to energy start. Dot, you know, uh, in the Energy Star website and look for those those uh, opportunities and really look for opportunities to stack rebates and tax credits together. Um, it's really going to save some money and uh, give you a more efficient system in the long run. Yeah, for sure. Michael Dean, really, really appreciate you guys taking time to uh, school us from your expertise. Uh, and I want to say in particular, a huge thanks to Carrier for sponsoring today. You know, when we talk about uh, equipment that, that meets these requirements, uh, Carrier is kind enough to talk about that in a generic sense, uh, rather than showing us nothing but slides of their equipment, uh, you know, because this works with all manufacturers. But a quick plug for Carrier, I've used a lot of their equipment, uh, including a house that I just did a terrific video on not too long ago. Uh, that had a killer carrier system. And I'm sure you know this already if you're watching, but uh, Michael mentioned earlier that he was the uh, product manager for Duckless. When we talk about Duckless systems and the outdoor unit that uh, is really the efficiency portion of that, uh, they have this technology that other manufacturers have as well called VRF, Variable Refrigerant Flow. And the quick basic on that, because I love talking about this, hope you know, Michael, is, uh, you know, variable refrigerant flow means that that outdoor compressor isn't just a one stage or maybe even a two stage piece of equipment, meaning uh, if it's a four ton unit, it's not just either off or running at four tons. Or in the old days, we talked about two stage equipment. In fact, there's still lots of that out there where it might run at 66% of its load, which might be, you know, three tons, let's say, uh, or four tons. With VRF technology, of which Carrier has some great equipment with VRF technology, it can run somewhere from maybe 15 or 20% of capacity all the way up to 100%, which means that it's inherently much, much more efficient than, for instance, single stage equipment, even though single stage equipment is great and might have a great, uh, you know, 15 or 16 or 17 SEER rating, this VRF equipment can ramp up and down at speed based on what the load capacity is. And what else is cool, check out that video I made with Carrier, is that outdoor unit that's VRF could be tied to uh, what we consider kind of typically a ductless mini split, uh, you know, a head on the wall. It could also be tied to a ducted uh, medium static pressure unit, which kind of looks like a couple pizza boxes stacked up uh, and has a smaller ductwork attached. Or it could be like at the house that I built recently that I made that video on, it could look like a standard high flow 1200 CFM standard looking box, but outside it's tied to that VRF technology. So you can have 
normal looking registers and grills in the house and returns, all that sort of stuff. But it's actually tied to a much more efficient back end, which is that VRF technology. So if you're not familiar with all that, get with your local carrier uh, rep, get with your carrier dealer, uh, get with your installer who might uh, have been installing carrier. They've got a, a lot of really terrific equipment. And if you're in Austin, Texas, uh, Carrier has a great dealer, which is only a couple miles from my showroom where I've done several videos and we've actually done a webinar there before uh, where they've got lots of this equipment that you can see for yourself. You know, what does a, a recessed ceiling cassette look like? What does a horizontal recess look like? What are some of the latest in, uh, you know, mini split heads? What do they look like? Uh, so anyways, big thanks to Carrier for sponsoring. Dean and Michael, thank you for your time today. And guys, for, for any of you yeah. watching this, builders, remodelers, architects, I sure appreciate your time and uh, in the hour of your afternoon spent with us here on this webinar today. If you're watching this later, remember, guys, sign up for that link in the newsletter because uh, my team here at Build Show Network is going to send an email to you every Tuesday and every Friday with what's new on the site, including these live webinars where you have a chance to answer uh, or where you have a chance rather to jump in and we can answer your live questions. But with that being said, guys, follow the uh, the Build Show on TikTok or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on Build Show. <laughs>